Okay, so we're back talking about induction motors. So um, necessarily when we're talking about induction motors, we're talking about AC motors, right? Because we need this changing magnetic field created by the electromagnets on the stator to induce a current in the bars on the rotor, on the squirrel cage, the bars of the squirrel cage. And when you have that current running through those bars, then you will have a force on the rotor because it's in a magnetic field. And so you'll feel torque on the rotor. And what we talked about at the end of the last video is the idea that you need this thing called slip. Let me change to a pen here. Um, you need slip. In other words, the speed of the rotor, that squirrel cage, must be less than the synchronous speed. In other words, the speed of the rotation of the magnetic field around the stator. That's the synchronous speed. In a synchronous motor, the speed of the rotor and the synchronous speed are equal. But in an induction motor, the speed of the rotor is always less than the synchronous speed. And depending on its operating conditions, it can be either a tiny bit less, you know, maybe 1% slip behind the synchronous speed, or it can be quite a bit less, you know, maybe 5 to 10% behind the synchronous speed. And it all depends on the application and the type of motor and things like that. Okay? But there's always this slip if you want any torque at all on the rotor, you must have this. Now, what I'd like to talk about today is, is sort of a simplified version of why that must be the case. I, I put it in words on the last slide, right? There won't be any changing magnetic flux. In other words, changing number of magnetic field lines through the rotor, and so you won't induce any current on the squirrel cage. But let's, let's strip it down a little bit, and hopefully the, the reason for this will be clearer. So uh, we're going to take our squirrel cage. So remember, each one of these is like the cross section of one of those aluminum or copper bars that we saw um, when we first introduced the squirrel cage. Or so if you sort of uh, twisted it to the side, it would look something you know, like, like this. All right, and so you have these end rings here and you have the bars of the squirrel cage. So this bar right here, and you sort of laid out to the side, would the cross section of it would look like uh, something like this, okay? They're not necessarily round, but that's easy to draw. Okay, so there's our squirrel cage. We're gonna just reduce it to one sort of loop rather than uh, a squirrel cage. So we're just gonna reduce it down to something that looks like this right, this thing. And that'll make it a little easier to see when we go to our next diagram. Okay, so this is uh, an AC motor. Don't worry about the electrical connections. We can just assume that, uh, for instance, we have a dual phase AC motor. So uh, maybe this set of electromagnets is receiving uh, phase number one, and this set of electromagnets is receiving phase number two. And that means that uh, because those two AC signals are offset relative to one another in time, that at this moment in time that we're showing here, we've got maximum magnetic field uh, being created by uh, phase number one. Okay? And I've drawn some of the field lines in here just so we had something to work with. And remember that in this case, I guess the field lines leave north and enter south, so the poles closest to the rotor on these electromagnets would be a north up here and a south down here, and I guess, of course, it's dipoles or something like that on the other side, but we generally don't care about these, these poles that are out here because they're not the ones closest to the rotor and thus relevant to its operation. Okay, so we've got a north and a south. We have magnetic field going this direction, and uh, if this rotor was turning at exactly the synchronous speed. In other words, it was turning in sync with the rotation of the magnetic field around the stator, right? So turning on and off essentially these electromagnets in sequence so that 
first the magnetic field points down, then maybe it points to the left, then points up, then it points to the right, around and around and around and around like that, okay? So if the rotor follows that exactly, well then this is what happens, okay? So the rotor has gone through a 90 degree turn, so we're, we're rotating this way okay, with the rotor. And we're assuming, right, that it's exactly following the speed of rotation of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field, uh, let me change colors, get my green here. So the magnetic field is also rotating here, right, because the <clears throat> first set of electromagnets, right, these guys here, now, at this moment in time, they're off, right? For a moment, there's no current going through those electromagnets, so there's no field being created by them. And these electromagnets, the horizontally oriented ones, uh, these right here, well, they, they must be at a peak of, peak or a trough of their uh, signal. And so they're creating lots of current going through the electromagnets, so they're creating quite a strong field to the left now. Okay, but the effect, right, is that the magnetic field has rotated 90 degrees, just like the rotor has. You will note that uh, we had four magnetic field lines over here. So one, two, three, four. You can count. Okay, so I won't, I won't label the rest of these ones over here. But you can see that there are four field lines present through the loop in this orientation as well. And if we let this go and we look at a couple more freeze frames, if the rotor is exactly following the magnetic field as it rotates, so rotating this, rotating this way, continue to rotate that way at exactly the same speed as the magnetic field direction is rotating on account of the, <clears throat> on account of the, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. On account of the AC signals being fed into the electromagnets on the stator, well, then the number of magnetic field lines is four initially, four in this snapshot, four in this snapshot, four in this snapshot, and if you were to go through all of the intermediate little snapshots and look at video or an animation of this kind of thing, you would also see that at the synchronous speed, if the rotor speed matches that, that you're never changing the number of field lines through that loop. If you're never changing the number of field lines through that loop, we know from Faraday's law that you're never going to induce a voltage difference, which means you're never going to create current flowing on the bars of this squirrel cage or through this loop. And so this thing will never feel a force. Now, it's, it's theoretically possible if you could eliminate like all the friction and you didn't have any inertia of the, the rotor itself to get it going to this speed, all that kind of stuff. You eliminated all the sort of real life stuff, but sort of non-ideal stuff in, in the design, you could imagine that the induction motor could maintain this speed. It just couldn't drive any mechanical load, right? It couldn't get anything to rotate because as soon as you asked it to rotate anything, well, there's no current in the rotor. So sure, it can whir along at a nice velocity, but you can't get any torque. You can't get any twist on it, okay? So you don't need any torque to maintain a velocity unless there's some resisting torque, you know, something pushing back. Uh, but you, you certainly do need a torque if you want to actually rotate a propeller in water or whatever the case may be with your induction motor. So um, that's the long short of why an induction motor must have slip if you want to produce any torque, and you always do, at least a little bit of torque, uh, on the rotor of the induction motor, okay? So thanks for sticking with me here. And the next video, I may take another video just to sort of sum up some things about AC motors, but we're, we're almost done with this unit. We just, just keep it short and sweet with the AC motors, just the basics. And we're gonna be moving on to uh, more general AC circuits and circuit elements and talking about the simple radio receiver circuit that will round out the course because we're, yeah, we're surprisingly close to the end of the semester. Anyway, hope you all are doing well.